My name is Nicholas Shank. I'm the head of undergraduate advising services for the School of Politics, Security, and International Affairs. Uh, today, we're going to have a workshop on honors research and specifically about the honors undergraduate thesis program. With me today is Amanda Emirati from the honors research. She's going to go ahead and give a presentation and um, hopefully we'll have uh, Dr. Marilovic, who is the honors undergraduate thesis coordinator for our school uh, joining us shortly. Otherwise, I'll be here to answer a lot of academic questions that you all might have. Um, Amanda will give a presentation and maybe have some, some time for questions. Um, and then we'll, we'll do a Q&A wrap up at the end. Um, all right, Amanda, go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Nick. And it's always a pleasure to uh, work with you to organize this. It's, a, it's always so fun to speak with and get to see whether it's in person or virtually um, SPSIA students. So um, welcome. Today I'm going to be talking about the Honors Undergraduate Thesis Program. Um, bear with me, I'm going to pull up my presentation. Okay. Hopefully this works. Sometimes when I go into presentation mode, I let's see. That's okay. I'm just going to work from, sorry, y'all. One sec. Okay. Um, Sorry, I think this happened last time too. Well, you, had, you had it on that last one. I did, okay. Uh, it was on the presentation actual yeah. or, okay, okay, thanks. Awesome, so you see it now. No, now you switch it over to the PowerPoint. If you just switch source to then the presentation. Sorry, everyone. Okay, I'm just gonna, is that? Oh my gosh. Okay, is this working? Still? You gotta, can you select the, uh, the other, there should be another PowerPoint window to select. So many, so many options come up. <laughs> yeah, oh, I know. Oh, here I, we go. Yeah. Is, is this good? Yes, perfect. Okay, thanks. Sorry, everyone. Um, welcome. <laughs> we roll with the punches here. Um, my name is Amanda Amirati. I proudly serve as the coordinator for the Office of Honors Research and the Honors Undergraduate Thesis Program. I'll be referring to it as HUT for um, this presentation. So um, HUT is um, also known as the Honors in the Major Program that is uh, widely known as HIM. That's how it used to be called, but now we've opened and expanded opportunities and access to the program. So we call it the HUT program, Honors Undergraduate Thesis. So um, my team in the Office of Honors Research uh, is comprised of Dr. Waldron. She's the director. Her and I have been working in the office since 2018. And we are really excited to um, have the opportunity at events like this where we get to uh, see, you know, a group of people who are all in the same discipline, but also we have general information sessions, a lot of events. Um, so she is a wonderful pioneer in undergraduate research at UCF. I serve as the coordinator and we have three amazing peer mentors. Um, one of them is Madison. She is a graduate of both Hutt and the Burnett Honors College. Jocelyn is a future Hutt student. She uh, joined us very recently. She's both a political science and legal studies major. So um, just like a lot of you in this room uh, who might be in that same boat, um, she's hoping to expand her opportunities at UCF um, in that major. And uh, I'm excited to, to help her through that. Um, and we also have Fook. She is a new um, peer mentor. Uh, she is currently writing a thesis in her major, which is psychology. So we have um, a bit of a distribution between the majors um, in our support sector of HUT and uh, peer mentors offer sort of that student perspective throughout the program before the program. So um, please let us know if you'd like to schedule a one-on-one -on -one with one of them. So there are many ways for students like yourselves to learn about the many opportunities uh, for researchers at UCF. Here on this slide, I have 
four of them. So um, this is a great opportunity to take out your phone, take a photo of this slide because Summer Research Academy intro and McNair ramp are opportunities that I highly recommend that students look into. We're just not gonna be talking about them today. So um, they're offered by our partners over in OUR, Office of Undergraduate Research and AAP, Academic Advancement Programs. Um, and they're, they're, they're fantastic programs, but um, you know, today we're gonna to talk about HUT. So um, one more second to take a photo of those opportunities, that way you can research them later. And now we're gonna talk about HUT. So HUT is the oldest and most prestigious um, undergraduate research program at UCF. Juniors and seniors from all majors have the opportunity to research, write, defend, and publish an original honors thesis in any discipline. Um, and that discipline can be in your major or in a related discipline or in your minor. The thesis is published through the university library known as STARS and is available to researchers worldwide through electronic databases, which is really cool at the undergraduate level to have that opportunity. So the sky's the limit. Um, this is where you really get to, to reflect on what are the possibilities of topics or people that you would like to work with at UCF um, which would determine whether your thesis would be in your major or interdisciplinary. So the honors in the major thesis, as its name implies, uh, students complete original, original research or creative work in their major. And that credit that is associated with the HUT program, which is six to 12 credits, um, that falls under your major. And it has a prefix and all of that that's associated with your major. Um, an interdisciplinary thesis is one where you um, write a thesis in your minor or in a discipline other than your major. So uh, let's say you're a political science major and you match up with a thesis chair in say uh, anthropology, I'm just, you know, random. But um, that would be considered an interdisciplinary thesis if it's not um, a major that is you know, declared by you. So um, the opportunity is there to do it, but you just wanna consider how does that affect your graduation plan? And those are things that um, you wanna consider with your, um, your academic advisor. So as you're preparing yourself for the process, uh, Nick told me that um, registration is coming up very shortly, the, the, the semester's flying by. So, a few questions that you'll want to have uh, ready to go as you're planning this out, making educated decisions. Um, how many semesters do you have left in your graduation plan before you graduate? And do you have room in your electives or elsewhere in your graduation plan to accommodate research credits? Do they have to be credits that are associated strictly with your major? Can they be credits from another discipline? Um, these are things that you want to chat with them about. And, um, whenever you do that, I would also recommend that you reach out to the Office of Undergraduate Research. Again, they are our partners, but their students, their peer mentors, um, work with you to devise a customized plan for how to go about um, how to go about uh, maximizing your plan in research at UCF. So, okay, maybe you start out here. Here's a way that you can get funding. Um, and you can petition to student government for funding for your research, whether it be um, travel expenses, conference expenses, we, we encourage you to do all of that. But um, our friends in, in the Office of Undergraduate Research are, are crucial in helping students in the planning stage as well. So the Honors Undergraduate Thesis Program allows students to engage in original and independent research as principal investigators and scholars. So I know that sounds a little, at, at least to me as an undergraduate, it would sound a little scary, but um, really it should excite you because what it means is you're making your own mark on your discipline. And over the course of two to four semesters, um, and you can start in and end in any term, um, you accomplish this research project, including a proposal, um, actual writing of the thesis, an oral defense, format review, publishing the thesis. So it, it happens in stages, but 
as that principal investigator and scholar, you are adding new knowledge to the discipline. So um, it's original, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're solving all the world's problems. Um, you know, we would we would love that, of course, but um, it has to be a project um, and a scope of that that discipline that is able to be accomplished within two to four semesters. So your thesis, your thesis chair is going to be a critical um, part of that partnership that will help you to either widen the scope of your proposed idea or narrow it down to make it something that is doable over that, that time span. So um, the originality for the thesis means that you're answering a question that has not been answered before or using a novel approach to an existing question. And um, you're coming to your own perceived um, conclusions through that research rather than um, citing somebody else's flat out. So, um, and the independent um, aspect that I mentioned earlier, it doesn't mean you're by yourself. I mentioned that you're working with the thesis chair. You're also working with another committee member. So um, this, this three-way sort of partnership in that research project means that you are getting that subject matter expertise, you are getting that mentorship and um, that support from leaders in the field. And um, so it's it's really exciting. It's, it's great for students who um, are curious, committed, and um, really uh, creative. Um, you are using the smaller project to demonstrate your mastery of skills that are needed in the discipline, knowledge that's needed in the discipline, and a capacity for future independent work. A lot of people in this room are going to go on to probably a master's degree. Um, and in that, in that program, you're going to have to write a thesis. And this program is modeled after a master's thesis program. The tenants that are found in a master's thesis are are features of this program. So you're showing future admission committees and even um, future employers that you are, um, you're, you're a safe bet because not only have you done something like this before, but you're, you're perfectly capable and you thrive in the opportunity to, um, to deliver results. So, who qualifies to join the program? If you're sitting here and you're thinking, oh, um, that tiny URL in the top right is wrong. I need to update that. Um, ignore that. I'm going to tell you the, the correct link. The eligibility criteria is as follows. The first step in letting me know that you're interested is to go to www.tinyurl.com slash hut dash application. It's a quick form. It lets me know that you would like to know if you're eligible to proceed in the admission process. Um, it, a few questions that you'll be asked, uh, what's your major? Um, what is your proposed thesis discipline? Uh, proposed thesis chair. This lets me know, you know, oh, I already have this person who's lined up um, and I, I'm thinking of working with them. Um, but you don't have to have a thesis chair um, or a name to add to that field in order to fill out this form. It's not necessary. So uh, no worries if you're not quite there yet, you can still submit an eligibility form. But once I see your name on that form, I, I check them and send out decisions uh, about once a week. Um, I'll be looking for the following four criteria on your degree audit. And you could take a look as well to see where you stand. So um, students hoping to start in summer will need to either now or at the end of the spring semester once grades post have at least 60 completed overall hours of college credit, 12 completed upper division credits, so that's 3,000 or 4,000 level courses, of at least a 3.4 UCF or overall GPA, whichever is higher is the one I will take, and then um, at least two or more semesters remaining prior to graduation. That's essential so that we know that you can actually uh, accomplish the minimum two semesters needed in the program. So if you're here and if you are graduating any sooner than um, fall 2022, unfortunately, uh, the timeline just won't work out for the HUT program, but we can surely set you up with um, resources for other ways you could get involved in research that isn't necessarily HUD, so. 
Um, one question that might be running through some people's mind uh, at the moment, uh, if you're currently taking courses to get you to any of these thresholds, like let's say you're currently taking the 12 credits needed to get to that upper division requirement, same with the 60 credit, um, I will take a look and see that you're enrolled in those courses. And if it, to me, looks that you will meet the admission criteria when grades post at the end of the semester, then I will issue a conditional yes. So I'll include the paperwork as if, as it, let's act as if you are moving forward. And then I will um, check that your degree audit, you know, that you've done super well this semester, everything looks good to go. And then uh, we proceed as normal. So, um, so those are a few different tiers of decisions, but please do, it's not, it's a non-binding agreement that eligibility form. Um, if you're at all interested, I think you should definitely consider filling it out, but what's not to love about the program? It's totally, um, it's customizable within reason. So how is HUT structured? Um, I just might be out of order, but so SPSIA honors thesis, these theses on STARS can be accessed at that, um, that webpage, that URL on the screen. Um, I encourage you to take a look at it. Um, you can also filter by discipline and collection. So um, on STARS, you can just Google UCF STARS, um, so the, the database will come up and you can filter by college. Um, I would recommend maybe filtering by college and from there you can filter um, within that and see all of the honors theses that have been published within each discipline. So if there's another discipline that you're considering um, matching up and, and working with a, a thesis chair from, definitely take a look at the theses that have been published there. But um, these, are, these are screenshots of it, but what we could do if this were the, the live webpage is actually uh, download a PDF version of each thesis, take a look at, um, you know, what, what did they talk about? What were their findings? How did, how, how does it look? And I think that's a really great thing at the planning stage to, to start to do. You can also see which chairs, which faculty members chair those theses and what are their expectations? Um, how long are they? Uh, what are what are the chapters? What are the components? What's the format like? So I highly recommend taking a look. But uh, a really fun um, fact is that everybody here who finishes the HUT program will have their own database of downloads and viewership throughout the world that they'll be able to track and monitor. And you'll be able to speak about that in those interviews on those applications, um, you know, the, the reach that you're having and, and quantify it, which is, I think, really awesome. Okay, back to the hut structure. <laughs> I, I think that other slide was um, misplaced, but anyway, so uh, this is the hut traditional course sequence. Um, earlier, I mentioned that you need at least two semesters before graduation in, in order to accommodate uh, this course flow. So the first stage of the HUT program is the proposal stage, and we call that directed readings. In order to move on to the thesis stage, you have to have a proposal that has been um, written, worked out, uh, researched, approved by your entire committee, and um, submitted to us that, that meets the requirements. And um, for us, just a, a brief rundown of what that looks like, uh, it's no less than five content pages for the proposal, um, but we recommend that, that you do more than just the five. Um, the more that you put into that proposal, the more of a sort of a head start you have on the rest of the writing of the thesis. And, you know, the more effort you put into it, the easier the rest of the, um, easier the rest of the thesis writing will go. So, um, but the, the proposal, for some students, it happens in one semester and they're able to move on to thesis one, but students who need an extra semester to accomplish that proposal um, for whatever reason, as long as everybody on the committee is on board, they can take directed readings too. And that would mean that you'd have to have another, at least another semester or two in your graduation plan, of course, to accommodate, but um, 
The long and short of it is that a proposal can take one or two semesters, uh, totally customizable depending on how the progress goes. And then um, the next semester is the thesis semester, thesis one and or two, if you need an extra, extra semester there. So um, in the thesis semester, it tends to go pretty quick. Um, you're, you're writing the rest of the thesis, you're doing that research, um, you're planning and formatting the thesis to submit virtually for format review to our thesis editor, planning your oral defense, which sounds scary, but uh, really it's just, um, it's essentially a, a presentation and opportunity for you uh, once the thesis is done and finalized to present your findings, your, you know, sort of a, a whole um, presentation on your research and future applications, what would you do differently next time? It's a, it's, it, it's with your whole thesis committee, they're present, it can be online or in person. Um, and everybody who's there, who's on your committee at that point is rooting for you. Um, you know, nobody's going in there, you know, with the thought of, you know, failing you, but of course you want to show up prepared and ready to knock it out of the park, but it's a, uh, it's a way to formalize the thesis and, and, and defend it. So after the defense, um, if it's approved, which uh, most of the time, well, all the time it is, um, they will, your thesis committee will sign off on your thesis approval form, send that into us, and we will send you instructions to upload the thesis. So it sounds like a lot, but really once you break it down, if you're able to really compartmentalize, you know, just like with any other course, with any other um, project that is ongoing, it happens in stages. If you are organized, if you're on top of things, um, then, you know, it can be accomplished. It's just, uh, it takes the drive to want to do so. Um, HUT is a credit bearing program. So directed readings one and thesis one are both three credits a piece. Um, students who opt to take directed readings two or thesis two can take each one of those for either one or for three credits, depending on, um, you know, what, uh, whatever whatever factors you know you you need to to consider for those but um it is a a minimum of six credits total the program for any university honors students who might be here hut coursework um may be used towards your honors requirements and hut coursework may also be used in general for for everybody who's here toward your major requirements that's another thing you'll want to talk about with your um your advisor um, especially thesis one, that's one that um, a lot of uh, majors will accommodate. These are a few um, quotes that I've taken from students that, um, you know, they're, they talk about the, the mentorship that they receive from their thesis chair. And it really is a unique partnership that um, is hard to replicate in most courses because you're one of you know, maybe it's 20 people, maybe it's 50, maybe it's 100, you know, depending on the class size, but um, the HUT program really allows you from day one to put your best foot forward in the way that you communicate with your thesis chair and your committee um, to, to, to rep your, represent yourself in a way that is um, professional. Um, and I have seen so many uh, instances where thesis chairs have had uh, a great, uh, you know, time re researching with the hot scholar that they look out for them for opportunities in the future, whether it be traveling to conferences, um, networking opportunities, mentioning them to, you know, maybe a colleague who's hiring, you know, the, there, there are so many ways to, to build bridges and, and those bridges can um, just really uh, astound people. So um, I can't, overstate how important it is to um, always be mindful of the time that your thesis chair, your potential thesis chair is dedicating to you and your project. And if you're giving them that mutual respect, I'm, I'm sure they'll give it right back. So it's, uh, it's really awesome. So who qualifies to be a thesis chair? This is something that um, you'll, you'll need to know as you're doing this exploring stage. Um, 
as you know, a thesis chair is somebody who serves as a mentor during the writing of the thesis. Uh, they're the person who uh, their department affiliation dictates which discipline the thesis falls in. So um, if the faculty member is strictly employed at UCF through, um, say, SPSIA, and you, you know, you're here, so you're, you're part of that college, it would, if you match up with them, it will fall under, um, likely under HIM. That's something you'll want to, again, chat with your advisor about. Um, but these are the titles that you'll want to look for. So uh, professor, whether it's assistant, associate, or full professor, that, that will um, apply, um, meet our criteria, um, or lecturer. Um, so instructors and adjuncts, unfortunately, don't qualify to chair theses because we want to make sure that um, that the person who is uh, helping you with your project will be there for the duration of your project. So um, whenever you're doing your research on who to choose, you'll want to look for these titles. So you'll, you'll want to take a, a picture of this slide. Um, I'll, I'll wait a moment before moving on. But yeah, that's really important um, that they have these titles, professor or lecturer. I mean, I just want to jump in real quick. Um, I did just share uh, a link to our webpage. Uh, the faculty section of our, our webpage, um, all of those faculty would meet the criteria to be eligible. And oh, okay, you already had it in the slide. No, we're on the same. No, I love it. I love the synergy. Thank you. But I had the no, link in the great. chat, so. Yeah, yeah. And if you, um, thank you, Nick, for putting that in the chat. Um, the, the link that Nick put in there, those are, um, and you'll see the titles under each name. Um, and I think, do, does it have their research interests posted on the same web page as well? Not really. Um, sometimes. Some have, have research areas, um, but all of them have uh, fairly recent CVs. Cool, cool. That's part of the exploration of it all, everyone. You know, it's your, um, the research starts now, but it's fun. Um, I've seen um, some students have an easier time than others when it comes to finding a chair, but uh, putting in the time is really worth it um, in the long run because you want to find somebody who um, both matches with your working style. Of course, you want somebody to challenge you. I don't think that, you know, I think you want to find somebody who you're comfortable working with, but you also, um, you know, you want to make sure it's a good fit, uh, both within subject matter expertise and um, teaching style. Review professor's uh, profile, webpage, CV, contact those whose expertise aligns with your research interests. You can also and are encouraged to engage with professors via discussions, in, you know, in class or after or office hours. I know if I, if I were a professor and if I had office hours set up strictly for, um, you know, meeting with students one-on-one, -on -one, if you were to take me up on that, you know, have already come in being um, well researched on my contributions and uh, coming in with a great idea like I think I would be super excited about that so you know think about put your put yourself in their shoes and, and um, be mindful of their time. Um, another way to look for potential faculty would be to look at those recently published theses on stars. You can see the faculty members names list, uh, listed there. You could filter by discipline college, search by name. If you, if you have a faculty member in mind, you want to see if they've already participated um, on a thesis, you can um, search their name in the search bar. So a lot of options here. Um, after doing your own you know, due diligence in looking, um, looking for a thesis chair, if you do need to tap us in, ask us for help, we are available um, by filling out the request for contact form on the honors research webpage. And um, yeah, so that's a few ways of how to find a faculty member. Um, there was one before that. Yeah, uh, just a couple ways of students, how they approach faculty. So um, you might have a faculty member that you've already, you know, taken their class or you just know them through UCF and, you, you know that you know, their, their research is something that um, excites you, or maybe you wanna have the 
prospect of working with them. So you chat with them about coming up with a potential idea together. Um, that's one way that students go about it, or they might have a project in mind or you know, a, a loose idea of where they wanna go with it and they wanna find the, the best faculty member who would have that expertise to chair. So, um, you know, there's no one size fits all way to approach it, but um, just think about what's important to you. Think about which, um, which, which subjects and which parts of the research are going to keep you um, excited to keep going because um, research, does pose, you know, unforeseen obstacles, you know, um, that's just part of it. It's a, it's a learning curve uh, for everybody involved at this level and at every level of research. You're gonna live and you're gonna learn. So um, the best thing you can do at this stage is to find the faculty member that will best support you through it all. But you must have a thesis chair in order to start the program. So you don't necessarily have to have a thesis chair to fill out the eligibility form. But if you are found eligible um, at the point that you need to complete the paperwork and submit that to us, the faculty member does need to be on board and um, confirmed at that point. So um, I sort of um, peppered in a lot of the reasons why you should consider doing an honors thesis. I think there are uh, so, so many. I think that as, um, as somebody who has, like myself, I've been a, um, an advisor for quite some time. Um, my previous role before this was an academic advisor. And I, I know a good opportunity when I see one. And this, this, you really get the most bang for your buck as far as time, credits, flexibility, um, the opportunity to really, um, like if, if you take advantage of this in the ways that I imagine are possible, you could be traveling, um, presenting your research throughout the program and after, um, really expanding your CV, um, gaining both fun and educational experiences that um, you might not otherwise have had access to if not for um, getting started in the program. So, um, HUT research topics are diverse and remarkable, just like the, the UCF student body. And I'm happy to report, um, last time I reported on this number, we were close to it, but now we have officially surpassed 1 million downloads worldwide. And that's just HUT theses alone. So that doesn't just happen by accident. That doesn't just happen overnight, but it, it has happened rather quickly, I will say. Um, for instance, in October of last year alone, we had over 34,000 downloads. And those downloads are both for people just wanting to learn more, but that's also people who are doing their own research, who are citing your research. Um, there have been instances where uh, people um, have been contacted many years later about their research and just like, wow, like this is really cool. Can I chat with you about this? So. Um, it, it allows you to not not to make you scared, but it's just, you know, it's pretty cool that you have the opportunity to have this reach. And that dashboard that I mentioned earlier will contain um, a, a downloads map, uh, just like the one you see here with all of the, the numbers and the bubbles all over the world. So um, obviously a lot of them are coming from the UCF area, but there's no shortage of downloads and, and it's not slowing down. I will say that. We're gonna celebrate uh, this year, this semester for our 1 million download bash. So um, now is a great time to get in on all of the fun that we're having in HUT because uh, it's guided by the success of HUT students. So um, I really you know, appreciate you being here to learn about it because this is the first step. I've had so many students sit in um, you know, an info session with me at this point who I can tell, you know, the gears are turning and they're like, okay, but how do I, how do I fit this in? It sounds great, but you know, is it worth it? And to me, the answer is yes, unquantifiably. Yes. It's that you, there are so many um, personal benefits that students receive while in the, in the program, that growth um, academically, they become deeper thinkers and better writers and um, when it comes to problem solving, um, 
you, you tend to, to look at things in a more complex way. And that's wonderful as, you know, new professionals and, um, you know, just you're, you're paving your way through your discipline. So it's, it's great to, to be mindful of these things now. So this is just a little hot benefits bingo card. Um, another fun way, I think, to, to see, you know, these are a few of the many benefits, but um, you earn that honors distinction on your diploma and your transcript. So anybody, anybody here who is not already part of the Burnett Honors College, you will become a part of the family by um, being in the HUT program and you graduate a Burnett Honors College scholar, an honor scholar, um, you know, by, by completing the program and graduating from UCF. So uh, that in addition to the upper level research credit, you're documenting your efforts and you join a community of motivated and talented peers. So uh, great, great opportunities to network with one another, uh, whether it be to um, attend our, our fun events, you know, we have like walking tacos or Palentine's Day or um, kicking back with Koi with the deans of the Honors College. These are fun, fun and social ways that you can build bridges with your peers and with administrators at UCF that um, might also, you never know, lead to other things. Um, you get that strong mentoring relationship with faculty. Uh, I mentioned earlier that you become a, you know, a deeper thinker, a more active learner. Um, there are also scholarships that you become eligible for just by being part of the program. Each semester that you're enrolled in HUT, you are eligible to apply for the HUT scholarship, which is $1,000. You're allowed to win it once. Once you win it, um, you know, you can't be awarded that specific scholarship again, but you know, that's a thousand dollars. I would take it. Um, so, uh, so that's the hot, the, the hut scholarship, but also the honors college offers, um, about $135,000 annually to, um, th through various different scholarships. So, uh, you'll have access to, to apply for any or all of the ones that you would like to um, just by being part of our community. So um, we're here to support you along, support you along the way. I, I know that, um, you know, I'm really grateful for Nick's support because he, uh, you know, shepherds students to the program. And I know he, uh, he does that because he sees the benefits that you take from it. So um, how do you get started? Um, as I mentioned earlier, the first step is in addition to um, preparing and planning your, your road ahead, uh, submit an eligibility form. You know, there's no reason really to wait uh, if you're thinking about it. Uh, it's non-binding, like I said earlier, so you could fill it out, let me know you're interested. Uh, you will need to indicate which semester you're kind of hoping to, to start HUT. I'm now accepting application or eligibility forms for summer C that um, ends after Friday, April 15th. So if you're hoping to start in summer C, you'll need to get that in before April 15th. Um, I'm also accepting eligibility forms for fall. Uh, that will end um, sometime in July. So you have some time for that, but why wait? Um, it's good to, to get started and um, if you are accepted, I will send you uh, the admission agreement, the registration form, tips for finding a thesis chair, due dates, um, all that fun stuff. So take a picture of this slide as well. I um, really appreciate, again, you taking the time to uh, hear me out, hear about HUT. It is um, a really prestigious way for you to get involved in research and to, to lay the foundation of um, of your career, really. Uh, but also, it does it in a way that's kind of fun and customizable, and it's unique. Um, you'll, you'll be hard pressed to find a program that offers so much, um, but also gives you the flexibility to work with your thesis chair to devise a plan that works for you. So I, I love it so much, and um, I appreciate you taking the time. Thanks, Nick.
Um, and joining us today as well is uh, Dr. Marilovic, who is the honors undergraduate uh, thesis coordinator for our school. Um, he's another great resource. Um, Dr. Marilovic, would you like to say a couple words? Sure. So let me also, in addition to all of this useful information you received from Amanda, uh, let, let me give you my opinion on uh, why you should do this, uh, both in sort of uh, general terms and in terms of the practical benefits. So if you think of the just the nature of the world that we're in, there is a lot of uh, information coming from all directions, uh, especially online, things like that. So the question is increasingly how to make sense of this. So how to organize it, uh, how to establish what are real relationships in the data and what are not, how to deal with the data. Right? If you do your own research, you're learning, uh, one, you're doing this yourself, two, you're learning a, a set of procedures to do this. So how to set up a research design, how to organize data, uh, how to establish causation, uh, questions like that. Uh, then next, uh, this is your opportunity to set your own agenda. So a lot of people, you know, when you graduate, uh, when you're no longer in the academia, you know, going to the professional world or you work, uh, you know, wherever you work, uh, for many people, you will be following somebody else's agenda. Uh, if you do original research as an undergraduate student, uh, this is your opportunity. You will have a lot of say in picking your topic and in choosing which argument to make. Uh, so that gives you intellectual freedom. Uh, and uh, related to that, uh, there is the, uh, there, in, in the world out there, there are many questions that are not receiving due attention. Uh, there are many countries that are not studied as much as they should be, or particular questions are not studied in the context of a particular country. Uh, there are lots of examples like that. So I've had the experience that I've done research and I'm checking, okay, has somebody said this before? And then I look and I say that nobody has done this before. And unless I did it, maybe nobody would have done it. And uh, doing something like that is an intellectually rewarding experience. So you may add something to the public sphere that if you don't do it, nobody's going to do it. You may bring a unique uh, emphasis, unique perspective, uh, something that you care about that you can contribute uh, to the, again, to the public sphere that otherwise wouldn't be there. Uh, so there are also some practical reasons uh, to do this. Uh, one, if you do, if you write an, uh, or if you write original research, a hard thesis, you're working on your research and your writing skills. Both of those are very general uh, skills that are used across all kinds of careers, jobs, uh, things you want to do. Uh, many associates in law firms do a lot of research and writing. So you can start doing that now if that's the career you want. If you want to go to graduate school, uh, you may need a writing sample. Uh, original research is a great writing sample. You want to apply for law school or graduate school, you need letters of recommendation generally. Uh, one thing that makes it a lot easier uh, usually for a faculty member to write you a strong letter of recommendation if they work with you closely on a research project, then they will know a lot about your skill set and about what you can do. And that gives uh, material for a stronger letter of recommendation. Uh, so I will, uh, I will stop there, but I think those are some of the key points. So true. Thank you for saying that. Yeah, and um, I think at, at this point, um, we want to hear your questions, if anybody has any. Um, this is a, a great opportunity to uh, learn more not only about this process, but also to, um, you know, I think, explore um, what this program has to offer. Amanda has sort of talked about it in, in the bingo board of, of you're an honor student and you get access to the funding, which I think is, is honestly for a lot of students, um, aside from all the very nice uh, benefits is a tangible one, <laughs> um, is a tangible one of, of, you know, you have the opportunity to also further your educational career here at UCF. Mm -hmm. Um, I know some students have talked about this to help in part potentially fund some study abroad opportunities because there are study abroad scholarships. Uh, there are also scholarships uh, available outside um, of the Honors College, specifically through the Office of Undergraduate Research for students who are, are doing uh, research. They'll fund you to go to present your um, thesis. Um, 
So I'll stop talking too. Um, does anybody have any questions? Are there any myths that we can um, debunk? I hear it's very hard. <laughs> I don't think that's a myth though. It's not, you know, it, I think it depends on how easy, I think some people can make it harder for themselves, if that makes sense. You know, if you're hard, hard to keep up with deadlines, not planning ahead, um, you know, you're, and this might also be obvious within your other coursework, right? You know, it's, I have just maybe poor practices of, you know, keeping track of my due dates and, you know, uh, within this, this very customizable opportunity, um, it does also come with that, that responsibility to come up with those interim benchmarks. Um, maybe you and your chair decide, okay, by this date or in a couple of weeks, we're gonna have uh, this part of the literature review done or this chapter or this editing. And then, so it really is, um, it's, it can be made easier on oneself to be organized and to sort of, uh, make sure that they're meeting those things. Um, how long would the actual thesis be? It depends. Um, it depends. Anywhere from, I mean, 30, 60 pages. It, it really does. It, it depends on the subject matter, but I would say anywhere from 30, 25, 30, 40, 50 pages is commonplace. Um, Dr. Morello, do you have any uh, examples of, I know you've worked with students. Do you have a, recall any, any lengths in terms of your undergraduate thesis for students? I mean, what, what Amanda said sounds uh, reasonable. I, I don't set to set limits when I'm supervising a thesis. Yeah, like there's one I just pulled up that's over a hundred pages. I would not say that's common or expected, um, <laughs> but you know, some people. Um, to swing back to the the you know the the question of of time management, the other thing that um, you know I talk to students about it's also it's a a opportunity where you can invest as much time as you want into it, um, which can also be somewhat, I know, difficult for some students because you can continue to research even when you're not enrolled. Um, you know, some, sometimes students start in the spring and maybe the faculty member isn't available over the summer or um, something like that, but you are still able to work on, on your project and you may come up with in conjunction with your, your faculty member, maybe some goals for you to, to reach, but obviously there's no one-on-one -on -one instruction or, or mentorship going on over the summer as much as you're doing the research independently and then following up in the fall when you, you re-enroll in the course. Um, and that's sort of the same way. I mean, is it an average of 10 hours a week or could it be 20 hours a week or 30 hours a week? It really sort of depends on what time you have available and how much you wanna pour into it. Um, obviously, the goal is for you to put in as much effort as it takes to have a product that you and your thesis chair and committee are, are happy with, but obviously, if you want to delve deeper into the topic and it's manageable, um, you know, you can invest a good amount of time in it. Are there any ideas that anybody has that's exciting them about research or, um, yeah, anything at all? Any questions, concerns? Oh, how important is the GPA requirement? It's important. Um, it is, uh, we do, we require uh, at least a 3.4 UCF or overall GPA. Um, but don't hesitate to fill out the, the eligibility form. And if, um, if for any, any reason anybody's denied in my um, email, I kind of, I, I link you to and inform you of other opportunities that you should consider as a, you know, somebody who's interested in research. So definitely um, 
fill it out. Summer C starts in May, I want to say. May 16th. Yeah. How can I get started with undergraduate research as a rising sophomore? Great question. Um, I would start by having a one-on-one -on -one session with Office of Undergraduate Research, whether it be on Zoom or in person. And um, you know, if HUT is also something that you're thinking down the road that you would like to get involved in, hopefully you are, uh, in your session, let them know that. And they can work with you to layer and stack different opportunities uh, that you could fit in from you know between now until uh, you're able to join us in HUT and conferences during and thereafter. So as a rising sophomore wanting to get involved in other undergraduate research, um, definitely meet with OUR and take a look at those um, opportunities I mentioned earlier, like intro, the intro course, um, and uh, summer research academy, things like that. Let me take the question about history. So uh, as political scientists, a lot of our data comes from history. So if, if you know a lot of history, that actually can uh, set you up really well to come up with a, with a way to test an argument. Uh, and your, your committee, um, you know, your, your thesis chair, um, you know, maybe in, in our major, maybe in history, but your committee can, can have an outside member from another discipline. Um, I, I've worked with a lot of double majors or, or you know, major and minor students who have a, an area where they want to overlap um, those different disciplines. And as long as you work with your, your thesis chair to make it happen, and, and obviously the committee members on board, um, you know, you can work to have an outside member as part of your committee. There's a question about the recording, you answered that. Um, we have a question from Tyler. Oh, um, yeah, sorry, I'm driving. So this is just the easier way for me to ask it um, as opposed to typing a question. Um, so my first question is, um, are, are we eligible to enroll in other honors classes uh, if we're eligible for the HUT program? And then my other question is, um, do we have to identify a thesis chair before the uh, May 6th deadline if we're planning on starting our research in the summer? Um, just because one of the professors who I asked uh, just said they'd feel more comfortable making the decision after uh, the spring semester has ended. Uh, so I was just wondering if I had time to actually wait on that or if I should pursue a different chair. Great questions. Um, with regard to um, the the one about whether you should wait or not with the thesis chair, um, if you're hoping to start in summer, then the paperwork for um, actually being enrolled, because uh, I do the enrolling for all HUT courses. So um, even if you're found eligible to join the program, um, through the paperwork that's submitted to our office, we enroll you and get you activated as a HUT student. So um, even just being an honor student in general uh, doesn't give you access to signing up for these courses. Uh, every student that enters the program has to start by submitting an eligibility form. If they're found to be eligible, I send the paperwork. You submit that to us um, with your, you know, with the thesis chair having already been confirmed and signing off on that paperwork with you and then I enroll you in the course. So um, uh, hope that answers your question. Um, yes, and then so once I'm already confirmed as being eligible um, and that I have the thesis chair and everything, could I take like other honors classes? Like uh, for example, one of the classes that I'm interested in taking is uh, honors diplomacy, would I be eligible to take that even though I'm not a uh, student of the Burnett Honors College? If there are seats available, so it's a on a space available, available basis, meaning like um, university honors students get first priority because they need those courses for um, to meet their honors requirements. But if um, say in honors diplomacy, they're after uh, registration's done, all that, um, 
if there are seats available, then um, you can request um, access to, you know, enroll in, in the course as a HUT student, yes. Um, it's just not guaranteed, uh, both because of space and you know, other factors. But yeah, you have you have the option to, to request it if, if there are seats available. You can't promise like wait list or anything like that. You, you, you though, have like first dibs over a non-honor student who may request right. to get in right. though. So yes, it is, you do have a priority. It's just honors, honors students have, have a requirement to take those sections. And so they have sort of a first dibs, but um, you would be above sort of a, a, a random student who just sort of says, hey, I talked to the instructor and honors has to approve it. Um, I've not had an, a, a HUT student have an issue get into an honors class. Yeah, no, the, the courses that we're usually talking about having trouble are, are more um, STEM. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I hope to see your eligibility form. Um, I have there a was a question. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, is this, if, if, if you're planning on doing um, the two semester uh, thesis, is this something that uh, typically other students in the past have done while carrying a full course load? Okay. Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, both a full course load and I mean, somehow, you know, a full-time job. Don't know how it happens. I mean, I realistically, I could tell you how it happens, but it, HUD students do amazing things. Um, when, you know, I keep saying the word organize, but when you're organized, if you can really sort of compartmentalize, okay, I have these two hours that I'm setting aside for my research, those two hours, every time they add up. And um, so, uh, you know, yes, absolutely. Um, students who are doing a full course load can do it. Um, students who have odd hours, it's also, you know, good, good for you uh, as well. You know, if you can only, maybe if your, your process or your workload only allows for you to work on your thesis from, you know, at 11 o'clock at night, you know, you, you can do that um, realistically, so. Yeah. One thing we also try to do in terms of incorporating it into your, your programming is, is you don't have, you know, it would essentially be a fourth class if you're trying to be full time. You're not trying to add on a fifth class as long as it makes sense for your programming, right? And we're not going to shift around graduation deadlines. At least that's not the goal, right? Um, but we'll, we can talk about how we can incorporate it into your, your major requirements or if you have a minor or certificate where it might make sense, you know, how we can incorporate that in if possible. Uh, but the goal would be to, to try and keep you at, at whatever you're comfortable with, whether it's a four or five course load. So yeah, there are plenty of students who overload with thesis. Um, that is not a requirement. And that's another reason why we um, offer directed readings two and thesis two as one or three credits, because if you wanted to take it for three credits um, to get, you know, to help you to get to that 12 credit limit, you know, um, we encourage that as well. And some students are, say, paying by the credit and they, you know, just want to list it as one, you know, we're, we're fine with that as well, but only for those optional um, stages. And Regarding the question, um, I don't believe the students in here, but um, regarding the question about grading, um, it's a uh, graded or pass fail, right, Amanda? The oral defense or the- Well, just the general grade? readings and- Oh yeah, uh, so the courses are built um, with the option for the thesis chair to assign either pass, uh, satisfactory or unsatisfactory or a letter grade. So at the beginning of the partnership, whenever you're completing your admission agreement, um, you and your thesis chair will come to an understanding. We, we recommend that you have the chat then, that way you know going forward that the expectation is, okay, we're doing this either for an SU grade or for a letter grade. Um, and we ask that you indicate that on the admission agreement. That way, you know, if ever needed to refer back to, we have it already documented, but, um, but the option is there for the chair to assign either one. So some students choose a letter grade, um, you know, with understanding that that also, you know, will affect their GPA. Students do great, they get great grades, you know, 
um, but you also have the option to do um, SU, which doesn't hurt or help the GPA. It just, uh, you know, just SU. So yes, uh, you will be assigned uh, your letter, letter or SU grade from your thesis chair throughout the, the duration of the thesis uh, project. So the course that you're enrolled in, they, they will grade that as, you know, a signifier of your effort and participation for that semester, just like with any other class. And then there was a question about, does our advisor have to be for our major or could they just be knowledgeable on our topic? Um, it depends on what the topic is. Uh, if your topic falls in your major, then your advisor would likely be from that major. Um, but if um, some, some topics are just interdisciplinary in nature, you know, you can kind of, uh, it depends on what lens you're looking through, uh, what, what, what subject matter expertise would best be brought to the table. Um, whichever faculty member that is, that will determine which major or discipline the thesis will be considered officially. So um, it doesn't have to be from your major. Um, it might, depending on what's important to you, how do the credits apply? Um, is it important for you, you know, in your journey to work with somebody from your major? Uh, those, are, those are questions you'll have to, you know, reflect on, but um, hope that helps. Chloe? Yeah, I just wanted to ask kind of a little bit more about your committee. Um, I've been working with a couple of professors just in the beginning stages of exploration um, and have a couple of people in mind for a chair, but also with regards to the committee, is there a recommendation on how many people that is? Is it more student driven? Is it more driven by you guys as far as that number goes and who those people might be? Um, so they have to be faculty at UCF, um, but really it doesn't, they don't have to be from the same major. We don't necessarily mandate that there has to be a certain um, number other than at least one. But I would recommend not to add too many because the more people that you're officially adding to the committee, the more people will officially have to be involved at critical points of the thesis. So for instance, um, like for the proposal, um, everybody who's brought on as an official committee member will need to review the thesis, sign off on it, uh, sign your cover page, all in time for you to get it into us. But more importantly, for like the thesis, the oral thesis defense, finding a common time for everybody to meet. If you have say, you know, three, four, or five members, you know, that really in reality you don't need that many. I would, you know, I would caution against adding unnecessary, you know, too many unnecessary members, but yeah. uh, most, most committee, committees will are compo compo composed of the thesis chair and one additional committee member, so. That's great. Thank you so much for that answer. You're welcome. You and your thesis chair this. will... Uh, think about this in terms of the nature of your question, right, and how you're going to test it. So say if you... You know, I don't know, you're using uh, GIS to, to analyze data, then you may want to add somebody to the committee who's a GIS expert. Or if you're comparing country A and country B or two different regions, then you may want experts on those two different regions. Thank you so much. That's great. All right. Um, do we have any other questions? Um, Tyler again? Um, yes, yeah, so I heard the question about the, uh, the committee members and that actually reminded me of something. So one of my professors who I had asked to serve as the thesis chair in the summer um, said they weren't available in the summer and that they you know, would be able to serve as the chair in the fall. Um, but I really wanna start my research in the summer. So they said they could be a committee member starting in the fall if I you know, got a different chair for the summer. Um, is that allowed where I guess a faculty member hops on later on. Like, does my committee need to be set up for the semester that I'm going into, I guess, is my question. Yeah. Um, so 
in the semester that you start, um, the committee member will need to uh, be involved in the sense that they'll they'll need to at least at the very minimum review and approve your thesis proposal, which would um, typically happen in that first semester. So if it's looking like this faculty member is really not going to be available, you know, for you uh, until fall, and if you're really hoping to start in summer, then you you might want to consider the possibility of not having this person as a, you know, on your committee, um, you know, but surely you can keep them updated on your, you know, on your project and stuff. But uh, if you started in summer, it, it would complicate having that person get involved. I mean, if you were to get started in summer, I can't advise you to wait until directed readings to, to, you know, accomplish those things because then the involvement that you're that you're doing in the summer is kind of it's already happening with the understanding that you're delaying um, critical parts of it which which I don't advise so I hope that helps okay thank you you're welcome it's a wonderful opportunity I've had uh, a lot of students who said it's uh, the most rewarding thing that they've done as um, as a student in general, uh, that it's it's really helped them to shape their uh, the path that they want to take. Uh, sometimes it helps them realize, yeah, this is you know this is the research that I want to continue to do. This is this is the direction that I want to go. And then sometimes they make a discovery along the way that you know pulls them in another direction. But either way. You're living and you're 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 learning by doing. So it's um it's active learning that is is really fantastic. Can't recommend it enough. Thank you, Amanda. Um, thank you, Dr. Marilovic. Um, thank you, everybody who attended. Uh, if you do have questions, um, I'm going to go ahead and slide everybody's emails into the chat. Um, you can reach out to. Uh, any of us to have a, a further conversation. Um, on our advising form for the school advising office, we do also have a, a criteria where if you do want to have a conversation about HUT, um, you can also select that and we can make sure that's the conversation. Thanks everyone. That's so, so great to, to be here with you all. And thanks again, Nick and Dr. Mirovich. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and everybody take care and have a good night. Bye, everyone.